And uh, turns out that's not true. After 70 years, it's not even a little bit true. And Palestinians, some of the old ones are around, and, and the young haven't forgotten. There's six-year-old kids in Dearborn that will tell you what village their Palestinian grandparents got kicked out of. So none of that is working out for them. Also, we reproduce at like the highest rate in the world. We have like the highest demographic rate. This is good. It's very good. Of course it's very good. Um, you know, just to give you a statistic, at, in 1948 when they kicked us out, they kicked out 150,000 or 750,000 Palestinians who became refugees. However, 150,000 Palestinians remained inside what is what you would call today Israel or Dakhil or Aradit Manu Arbin or whatever you call it. 150,000 Palestinians. My family was from those. And um, if those 150,000 Palestinians had grown after 70 years at the average population growth rate of the world, uh, they should be around 450 or 500,000 Palestinians. Do you, does anybody know how much they are? They're more than that. They're 1.7 million. So uh, we have been very active for, uh, <laughs> for 70 years. I always tell people they wonder why Palestinians have a high birth rate. I say we're the only people in the history of the world that were able to get a woman pregnant just by looking at her. So um, imagine what happens when we start touching each other. I was in Jerusalem and the Israelis are changing the street signs. You know, the street signs in, in, inside Israel are, are in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And the street signs around Jerusalem used to always say for the longest time in Hebrew, Urushalim, in Arabic, Al Quds, and in English, Jerusalem. But about five years ago, they, they changed their street signs, and their street signs around Jerusalem now look like this. They've written in Hebrew, Urushalim, and then they've written in Arabic, Urushalim, and in parentheses, Al Quds, as like a, you know, parentheses, and then in English, Jerusalem. Think about that sign while I'm saying my last one here. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, this is from December 26th, 2014. Two weeks ago, I was in Jerusalem. I stayed in the Jerusalem Hotel, one block from the largest entrance to the old city. I ventured through the city's storied alleys, ancient stairways, and vibrant markets over and over during my few days there. I ate hummus, visited holy sites, and bought souvenirs. When I did make a purchase, I naturally bargained down the price a bit. But not as much as I would have if I had been in any other land. I just didn't feel right going back and forth too much with those of my people who have remained in the old city for so long. Also, people pay me to tell jokes. I have a pretty good life. I have no problem giving a small portion of each ticket price to the Palestinian economy. The Arab residents of the old city have been present for centuries. Today, the population of the old city is comprised of about 37,000 people, including 27,000 Muslims, 6,000 Christians, 1,000 Armenians, and 3,000 Jews. That means there's at least 33 Arabs inside of Jerusalem's old walls. That's 89%. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, no matter how hard anyone might try to deny it, Jerusalem's old city is an Arab place. It's been that way for almost 1,400 years. 47 years of white people from Europe hasn't changed that. Hebrew and Arabic are both official languages of the State of Israel, although there are some initiatives underway in Israel to revoke the status of Arabic. As such, all road signs in the country are displayed in Hebrew, Arabic, and most times English. Why English? Well, many of the Jewish residents of Israel speak English as a first language. Also, $3 billion a year gets you a lot of perks, unless you're an American citizen of Palestinian descent trying to visit your homeland, but that's another story for another day. However, in the past decade or so, Israel has undertaken a campaign to renovate its road signs. Now, it was already true that many highway exit signs in Israel completely ignored the Arab villages that they led to, instead naming Jewish towns that one only reached after passing by these invisible Arab locales. But the campaign I am referring to is specifically related to Jerusalem. In Arabic, Jerusalem is Al-Quds, 
which means the holy place. Until this latest campaign, all road signs indicating a path to Jerusalem denoted the name of the city in English, Arabic, and Hebrew, each in their native pronunciation. In other words, the sign read Jerusalem, Urushalim, El Quds. But the signs have changed. Now they display what you see in the photo above. We have Jerusalem in English, Urushalim in Hebrew, and then something strange in Arabic. Instead of displaying the Arabic El Quds for Jerusalem, we get the Hebrew transliteration into Arabic. That's right. Yerushalim is translated, transliterated into Arabic. However, just in case anyone doesn't know what they're getting out, they give us Al-Quds in parentheses. Parentheses? This might be more offensive than deleting the name altogether. Parentheses make it sound like something superfluous or insignificant or sometimes even sarcastic. For instance, she asked me to come over to her apartment at 3 a.m. She asked me to come over to her apartment, so I ran to my car. She asked me to come over to her apartment, I wish. Urushalim al Quds. Urushalim al Quds. Urushalim al Quds. I kept seeing it. I kept getting angry. I kept feeling defeated. Then I went back to the old city. Sure, I saw a few of those teenagers in military fatigues holding M16s. But when I saw who they were pointing their guns at, I saw restaurant owners serving falafel, hummus, and shawarma. In other words, I saw Palestinians and some Israeli soldiers. Sure, I saw a few Israeli flags flying around here and there. But when I saw what they were flying over, I saw people speaking Arabic using wildly unnecessary hand gestures and kissing each other on the cheek too many times. In other words, I saw Palestinians and some Israeli flags. Sure, I saw some of those European-looking guys peering from their balconies onto the alleys and streets of the old city. But when I tried to see what they were looking at, I saw shopkeepers selling cardamom and cumin. Arabic artifacts and embroidered accessories. I saw women pushing their mint and za'atar. I saw men marketing their kafiyas and rosaries. I saw locals. I saw my people. I saw Palestinians and some Israeli guests. Jerusalem possesses the flavors of many cultures. She reaches out to all the children of Abraham. Even for a skeptic like me, one cannot deny the gravity of walking in her streets, her arms are wide open. She is welcoming. I know all of these things. I've seen her. But while I know what she is, I also know what she is not. Jerusalem is not Polish or Hungarian or Russian. She's an Arab. If she could speak, she would invite me over for dinner and pile food on my plate, even when I told her I was stuffed. The lemonade she would serve me would be overly sweet and sour. And she would ask me why I wasn't married yet. And when she would utter anything to me, I would understand her. Because while Jerusalem can speak to anyone, her favorite language is Arabic. And lucky for me, she has a Palestinian accent. While I was strolling through the markets of Jerusalem, a nice leather bag caught my eye. Now, I'm usually pretty worried that I give off a pretty American vibe whenever I walk around in Palestine. But as I was bargaining my way to a purchase, the shopkeeper told me he would give me his rock bottom price. After all, as he said, I am Ibn al-Balad. I'm a son of the city. Maybe I got the best price, maybe I didn't. I didn't really care. At that point, I was jubilant that he knew that I, like him, belong there. Next time I visit Jerusalem, I'm going to try to find that guy again. I need to ask him what it is about me that let him know that I was her son. I really need to know what that thing is so that I never, ever change it. All right, thank you. Please.
and gentlemen, this has been the Dearborn Open Mic. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah.